All right. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to ALTA's latest Insights webinar. Uh, apologize for the sl slight delay. Had a few uh, technology issues, got everyone uh, connected, and we can uh, get into the presentation. Uh, I'm Jeremy Yowie, ALTA's Vice President of Communications, and today we've got a great presentation lined up to uh, discuss RESPA compliance uh, focused in, on Section 8C. Um, just have to go over a few housekeeping items. Um, like we always do before before starting, uh, today's webinar is being recorded. You'll get an email tomorrow with a, a link to the recording as well as a link to download a copy of the presentation. Uh, you can grab a PDF from the email section and go to the webinar window. Uh, we will hold some time at the end of the Q&A, so submit uh, your questions in the chat box and get to the end. Uh, do need to thank Ramquest for sponsoring today's uh, webinar. And before we introduce a speaker, here is a short message from Ramquest. RamQuest offers an end-to-end -end production solution for title and settlement operations, plus a direct connection to the industry's most extensive network of service providers, all built on a customer-first foundation. So if it's title and settlement related and you need it, we've got it. Visit RamQuest.com. So if it's title and settlement related, Okay, well, that was interesting. I had a little feedback trip. I don't know if you heard that extra recording, extra sound in there, but uh, did on my end. <laughs> no. No? All right, I've got gremlins or something on my computer today. So um, anyway, thank you. Thank you, RamQuest, uh, for sponsoring um, today's presentation. Uh, let me uh, introduce today's speaker. Uh, joining us, we have the pleasure to hear from Trip Riley. Uh, Trip is uh, well uh, versed, experienced in this industry. He is the uh, co-leader of Sal Ewing's um, team of attorneys that represent and counsel clients in the title and settlement services industry, um, including title insurance underwriters and agents, lenders, brokers, loan servicers, you know, pretty much the gamut of, of providers in the real estate industry. He, he also represents settlement service providers in government, governmental investigations and enforcement actions and has litigated uh, several uh, commercial disputes uh, in which settlement service industry clients have been involved. Um, so Trip definitely knows uh, your business, the title and settlement services business. Um, Trip, with that, um, I'll turn the conversation over to you. Thank you, Jeremy, and I uh, appreciate uh, you inviting me to speak to everyone today. Hello, good morning or good afternoon, whatever your time zone might be. Appreciate you being here. I know we're a bit a bit delayed, so I'm just going to start right off don't worry if you do have questions uh, i know you can uh, uh, type them in and jeremy can uh, read them off at the end of the of the session so while this um, presentation is going to be primarily on section 8c which are those exceptions to section 8 i think we need to obviously begin with a little primer on section 8 um, that uh, RESPA, uh, which prohibits uh, kickbacks and referral fees uh, in a financing, financing transaction where the mortgage is uh, federally backed, federally guaranteed. So if we're, we're not talking about transactions that are hard money lenders. We're not talking about, um, you know, commercial, but regular, regular residential uh, financed mortgage financed uh, transactions. So as to section 8A, in terms of the anti-kickback provisions, it's that no person can give or receive. So the person is a company, it's an individual, it's a partnership, and that person can, can either give or receive anything of value pursuant to an agreement or an understanding to refer settlement services in connection with a federally related mortgage loan. So it's not just about someone who's giving that thing of value for, for a referral, but it's also um, prohibits anyone from receiving those things of value. So we're, you're, you can be liable on both ends, giving and receiving. Um, next slide, please. 
Um, there is also section B, which is a split, no splitting of fees. So it may be that uh, it, it, it dovetails very nicely into, by way of 8A. So no person shall give and no person shall receive a split or percentage in connection with a real estate settlement service other than for services rendered. So think about in the nature of, uh, again, title insurance. Uh, if you had a real estate agent um, um, providing some sort of services related to those, to the uh, issuance of title or the closing, you can pay for those services, but they actually have to perform those services and they have to um, uh, be paid fair market value for them. You can't just take a bit of, of your premium uh, and, and send it on over to a real estate agent um, when they didn't do anything other than just uh, potentially refer. Um, but there, but just to be clear, no referral is required, um, but at the same rate, you can't split those, those fees. Next slide. So what are the 8C um, exceptions that we really live with every day, but don't even really think about it? Um, so payment for attorneys for actual services rendered. Um, so it may be that the real estate agent refers uh, the customer to the um, attorney, um, but as long as that attorney is being paid for actual services rendered, uh, that's not viewed as either a referral or as the attorney getting a thing of value. Uh, set number two, payment by title companies to its duly appointed agents. Um, even though, of course, one could look and say, well, an agent is referring the customer to the underwriter, and then the underwriter is paying for that referral. Well, not really. It's paying for the services rendered by the title agent, both the, uh, you know, the premium that is not a referral fee. Uh, nor is number three, payments pursuant to a cooperative brokerage and referral arrangement. Uh, so as long as a, as a real estate agent is licensed in one state and there is reciprocity in another state, um, that agent can refer customers from say New Jersey to California and get paid the standard one third of that, uh, that brokerage's commissions. And so if it's one third of the entire brokerage, whether it's 5% or 6% or just one side of the, of the transaction. The other thing to keep in mind is number four, which is employees can get paid based upon volume of referrals. So where you most typically see that is where a brokerage company is paying their office manager or perhaps an employee who is a marketing person uh, based upon the capture rate for their title company or their mortgage company or both. And as long as they're an employee and they're getting paid based upon that volume, uh, either whole or in part, that is okay. And that's the same thing for a licensed title producer uh, who's your sales representative. That is also not considered a referral fee. And then, of course, transactions in the secondary market where you're taking a uh, loan, um, you're either securitizing it or you're selling it one off, and you're sending that off to the secondary market, payment for that. Uh, even though there are servicing rights associated with that, is not considered uh, a referral fee or a thing of value. So those are the standard ones, um, which we just use every day without even really thinking about it. But we go to the next slide. And this is where we see um, what has historically been marketing services agreements, administrative services agreement, desk and office rentals, or shared employee agreements. Um, and in, the, in this instance, it's very similar to some of the analysis that we just went over for, uh, for section 8C1. You can have those type of marketing services agreements or any other type of services agreements with a company uh, who is referring you business as long as what you're paying for is one, real services rendered, and two, at a fair market value. So again, using, for example, a marketing services agreement, you can have 
a title company and a real estate company, and the title company is paying for the marketing services that the real estate company is doing for the title company. You can, and, and, the, and the, uh, the PHH case, the decision by, um, by that circuit was there can be a referral relationship. So in fact, you could have the title company say to the real estate company, I'll pay you for these marketing services at a fair market rate for the services you're actually rendering, but I'm not going to do it unless I get some referrals from you. And so the court recognized that you can split the difference, the split, the referral from the, from the payment of the actual services rendered. Now under Caudre, the, he would never have accepted that. And in fact, that was the argument in PHH where um, Caudre at the end of the day, even after the, even after the uh, circuit rendered its, I'm sorry, the district court rendered its decision said, no, I'm gonna rewrite that. I'm gonna, re I'm sorry, let me back up. When the, when the ALJ rendered his decision, he said, he's, I'm gonna rewrite that. I'm not gonna accept that. And, and there can be no referrals at, in a situation uh, if you're trying to use 8C2. So there could be no referrals, but the circuit court found that, that there could be uh, and, and, and was able to distinguish between I'm getting a referral, but I'm not paying for the referral, I'm paying for the marketing services or I'm paying for the desk rental or the office. office. Um, as long as, again, not to beat a dead horse, but as long as the services are actually being rendered and there's fair market value being paid. No, no, you know, uh, $5,000 a month for a banner ad on someone's website. That that doesn't work. And then you also, of course, you have to think about that these marketing services, they cannot be a warm handoff of the client to the title agent or the or the customer to the mortgage company. Uh, we, we saw that in a couple of cases in California where the CFPB said, no, you know, you've, you've, you've camouflaged this as a marketing services agreement, but you're really not doing any marketing to the community. You're simply taking Sally Smith, who's bought a house and saying, hey, let me introduce you to this title agency or to this mortgage company. They're great. And they're handing that person off. That is not a marketing uh, service. That's not an advertising service. That's a referral fee, no matter what what you call it. You know, it's if it if it quacks like a duck and walks like a duck, uh, it is a duck. And in this instance, if you're just simply handing off customers to another settlement service provider, even if you have a marketing services agreement or administrative services agreement or desk rental agreement, you know, if you're never in that office, you're never using that desk, and really all you're all you're doing is doing a warm handoff. Uh, then, then that's not going to be viewed as a legitimate agreement. Um, so, I hope that was uh, that covered those for you. If you have any questions, you can obviously put them into your post. All right, next uh, next slide. So this is where we've seen the most action in the last uh, three years, and even now with the market market changing. Slightly, lightly, uh, you know, I mean, it's really obvious, obviously there are less uh, refis and the purchase uh, purchase orders have gone down a bit because of the one lack of inventory two higher interest rates. I still am seeing a tremendous amount of joint venture activities or AFB uh, activities. Um, and this is where two settlement service providers and for the purposes of this presentation, let's just say title and, and a real estate company or the owner of a real estate company get together. They form what's called a joint venture. So they get an operating agreement and each of them own some percentage of the, of the company. Uh, it's a standalone title agency. It has an employee, which is a uh, licensed title producer so that that person can provide core title services. Uh, in this instance, in, in an AFB, in order for it to be a legitimate standalone company, that joint venture must have an employee who is a licensed title producer who actually provides the core title services. All other services, if you want, can be um, provided by that title partner's existing title agency. Um, it just, all those services have to be paid for and they must be documented in an administrative services agreement and the price has to be fair market value. 
It has to have its own office. It's all the former HUD tests. Uh, yes, there is there is um, a Sixth Circuit case that said you, that the CFPB can't use that as a definitive judgment as to whether or not there's this the AFB is legitimate or not, and therefore could stand to get um, uh, shut down and, and have civil penalties. Um, but you can, but in this, but basically it's the same tests, standalone office, uh, own technology, own licensing, own um, uh, license from the state, own underwriters agreement, um, own phone number, um, own E and O, insurity bond, um, takes in orders, and if it's a if it's a full service title agency, then it has its own escrow accounts, uh, has its own tax account, it has its own operating account. And the two investors have put in capital, not only to stand the company up, pay for my fees to help them put together the operating agreement and other, and other agreements, but also for three months worth of operating expenses as if no revenue was coming in. Um, and so the two partners come in and they put that capital into their capital account um, and they're good to go. But as this slide tells you, there are three requirements. Uh, that is that that joint venture existence is disclosed by the referring entity or, or in this instance, the, uh, either the, the brokerage company itself, uh, or we could talk about in a second, if there are agent investors disclosure that, that the agent investor uh, has an interest in the joint venture. That disclosure has to be made. It's the affiliated business disclosure. They cannot deviate. The, the Reg X has exactly what that disclosure is supposed to look like, uh, and you cannot deviate from that. Uh, also, the consumer cannot be required to use the affiliated joint venture in order to get services from, um, uh, say, in this instance, the real estate brokerage. They couldn't say, I'm not going to list your house or I'm not going to act as your as a, as your buyer's agent unless you use this uh, joint venture. You, you can't do that. Now, you could have a joint venture between a builder and a title agency or a builder and a lender, and the builder could say, I will give you, um, you know, some upgrades or I'll give you a discount on the purchase price of the, of the home uh, if you use my affiliated businesses. Now, that's not a requirement because they still have to sell the house to them, but they don't have to give them the upgrades and that's permissible. Uh, and, and the only thing of value that the investor, the two settlement agent uh, company owners and or in the instance of, of the title agents, uh, if they're investors, the only um, thing of value that they can get is the return on investment. So if in the most classic instance where you have two, you have an owner of a real estate company, an owner of a title agency, they've entered in joint venture and they've decided to go 50-50, then each gets 50% of the profits. And if there's some investment by agents, whatever their percentage is, that's all they get. And you can't vary that percentage up and down um, based upon the amount of referrals or closed end deals that, that either the real estate company is providing or the agents are providing. You can't do that. You can't kick agents out uh, of the company because they are not been as productive as you would hope they would be in terms of referrals. There are certain things that you can do with respect to agent investors. If they're no longer a licensed um, LO or a licensed uh, real estate agent, they move from one aid from the agency that has the affiliation with the joint venture. They move to another. You can have that as an automatic withdrawal. Their participation in the meetings or their failure to can be an automatic withdrawal. Um, their violation of any statute regulations or the conviction of a crime. Their death. Their bankruptcy. Uh, those are some of the some of the ways in which, if that happens that's an automatic withdrawal and you're able to set those joint ventures up in the operating agreement so that uh, the payment to them, uh, if there is an automatic withdrawal, is just their initial capital. And that's all have been um, uh, approved and accepted by the CFPB as not being uh, violative of the, of the, of the statute. Um, just a little word on investment. Typically, if there are agent investors, um, this, you want to make sure that they're coming in as investors through a private placement memorandum because 
the, if, you, if they're buying interest in this joint venture, that's a securities, this is a securities offering. And so you need to make sure that you're complying with both state, federal and state securities laws. Um, that's a benefit for you guys if you do that because you wanna be able to have an offering memorandum that describes to them uh, you know, all of the uh, potential problems, but also the upside of investment and your state and federal regulators, you wouldn't want them to come in and say to you, hey, this was, an, this was a securities, you've done it three or four times, um, and now you have to shut down and you have to return all the money to everyone else and perhaps pay a civil penalty to uh, the state or federal government. So if we move on to the next slide. As I mentioned, uh, RESPA provides exactly what the disclosure should look like. It's Appendix D of Regulation X. The uh, preliminary field uh, allows for identification of who the investors are, what the affiliation is, maybe it's joint ownership, um, uh, and, I, and, and um, if the agent is a direct investor, um, then it's identifies the space identified for the agent who has been, who's doing the referral to the customer. And as I said, it, it gives a notice and description of the relationship between the affiliate and the party who's providing the referral. Uh, it also will then have in the in a title disclosure, it will also have the standard uh, rates. Um, it'll have it'll be a, an estimate of rates that has to go right in the middle. It also has to say you don't have to use this joint venture. We want you to, but you don't have to use it. Um, and there's that there's other people and other companies that can provide uh, similar services and similar rates. And if you want to, you should be able to shop around for that. And last, you have an acknowledgement line that says that the consumer understands everything above and they read it. Uh, some of these uh, disclosures also have an approval saying yes, and we agree to the to uh, use this title agency. I'm okay with that, even though it's not specifically uh, called for in the uh, right in the Appendix D, but I think that little line that simply says, I acknowledge, I've read this, I understand it, and I will use XYZ title agency is perfectly okay because you'll get that in writing from them and, and you want to make sure that that's in the, in the file. Next slide. As I said, um, settlement charges, ranges of charges need to be there, and that's, and that's uh, you know, right in the middle. And again, in a block paragraph, with, and it's bold, you can see there in this slide um, all about not being required, frequently other settlement service providers available with similar services. That is an absolute necess necessity. Um, and it's a necessity because the CFPB wants consumers to understand, one, they don't have to use a party that's being referred, a company that's being referred to them. Uh, and, and two, um, that there's other services out there that can be shopped for. Next slide. So I thought I would give you a list of other type of, of JVs and other types of relationships that you should be thinking about, um, not necessarily because you should be getting involved in them, uh, but rather if you're asked to get involved in them, you understand that RESPA also applies to them, to them as well. And everything I just went over applies to them just as well. Um, so one of my, uh, it's a little bit of a pet peeve, um, but I've seen companies do it, is where you have a, let's use a title joint venture as an example, and rather than the agents and the owner of that real estate company coming in as individual investors, whether they're different classes of units or not, they come in as one. So you have the title partner is say a class one investor, he, gets, he or she gets units of class one at say, let's say 50%, and then the real estate brokerage owner and all the agents that they want, they don't, for some reason, they don't want to come in individually. They want to come in through their own LLC. That's okay. You can do that. Uh, it's then the LLC, that investment LLC or investor LLC that is doing the private placement and not the joint venture itself. Um, doesn't make a lot of sense to me because it's all a pass through um, in terms of uh, revenue profits and taxes, but sometimes the real estate agents or brokerage owners feel like they want to control a little bit more. They, are, they, they can get the same amount of control and same amount of decision making and same amount of um, 
uh, latitude over who they let in by simply letting the agents invest individually. They would come in as a class three unit member. They typically don't have voting rights um, and they have all those automatic withdrawal uh, triggers that I mentioned. But in any event, if you do that, if you do have someone who says, no, I wanna come into this joint venture uh, with my own LLC, uh, and I want to have agent investors, or I want to have other other referral sources uh, as investors in this LLC. Then my recommendation to you is that you go through that operating agreement uh, for that investment LLC with a fine tooth comb. Have a lawyer look over it because you do not want to be in a situation where um, the majority owner of that LLC, say an, an owner of brokerage, has the authority to kick agents out whenever they want to, or change their percentages whenever they, they want to, or, or allow people to come in or come out depending on um, the amount of their referrals. All of those things are no-goes under RESPA. So uh, again, you can do it, but it takes another layer of compliance management. Um, I've sort of gone all, already over the JVs with agent investors. They're okay, they're fine. Um, uh, you know, the only thing, it's not really a RESPA issue, but it's really a controlled business limitation issue in some of the states like Ohio, Tennessee, Louisiana, Washington, um, used to be New Jersey, where they had a limitation on the amount of business that a title agency could receive either uh, in this instance from referral sources um, to a certain percentage. And so um, in those instances, like Tennessee and Ohio, um, that regulation, even if you have agents, investors, and an owner of the broker, brokerage being an investor, they're going to view that, those regula regulators are going to review that as one source of business. And so uh, you would be stuck, say, in Tennessee at 40%. Ohio, I think, is 40%. California is 50%. Uh, Louisiana is 40%. Um, so what does that mean? Well, that means that you've got to uh, do more than just seek business from your agents, the agent investors, or the real estate companies, owners as the investor. You need to have a uh, sales rep going out there, beating the bush, trying to find other business. Um, and sometimes, you know, that can be an issue for, title, for the title partner because he's like, well, is my title joint venture going to be my competitor? And, and it w very well could be but you just need to focus on perhaps other areas of business that your title agency doesn't normally uh, go after. Um, there certainly can be title joint ventures with loan originator investors. Um, if it's a lender, they're going to have to deal with the 3% uh, costs and fees cap. But if it's a large lender uh, and the the value of the homes are say in excess of $350,000, that those fees by the LO can be readily um, changed and reduced and so forth. So that's okay. It, that that 3% uh, cap does not apply to, to brokerages. So if you have a brokerage owner or an LO that's at a brokerage, you don't, they don't have to worry about the 3% cap. Um, but again, it's something that you can do, but again, you want to make sure that the operating agreement is tight. Um, and if you're doing a bunch of LOs, that you're going to do a offering memorandum that complies with state and federal securities laws. I've recently seen an uptick in home hazard insurance JVs. Uh, it typically follows uh, the title, but again, um, typically these are partnerships between existing home hazard insurance brokers and real estate brokers, but there's no reason why it couldn't be with a title agency either, especially in the instance where the title agency is controlling much of the transaction and they say, hey, we need to have, you need to have home hazard insurance. Um, here, you know, uh, we, rep, we refer, we're, sorry, we refer you to ABC title, um, ABC home hazard insurance company, uh, and, that, and that can work. And of course, it also works because a lot of times these home hazards insurance also have life insurance and, and auto insurance and boat insurance. Um, and so that joint venture could cover all of those offerings as well. I've also recently seen home warranty companies uh, at joint ventures. Um, in particular, um, I think uh, it's, been a, it's been a while, or I should say there is the advent of the home warranty companies starting a joint venture with, with title. 
I mean, sorry, with, with uh, real estate companies, uh, because the agents are there. The agents are right there and they're, they're just like with title, uh, they're a, a great source of referral business. Um, but you can always have a joint venture in, home, in any of these, home hazard, uh, home warranty, um, and it could be a three-legged stool. It could be with the existing title partner, uh, home hazard insurance partner, uh, and a title agency and a real estate company. So you're getting you're getting it all from you know sort of the uh, start of the transaction and through the end of the transaction. Again, you just want to be careful of everything that I said about the, the operating agreement uh, and the and the, if you have those multiple investors, um, you want to make sure you're doing it through a private placement. There has been recently a, a discussion, at least among some of my uh, colleagues, what about where you have um, a joint venture, uh, no, I'm sorry, not a joint venture, but a relationship where um, there is a, there's a, say, a real estate platform. And if you use that real estate platform, um, the customer, the buyer is going to get a reward post-closing. Uh, it might be uh, a $500 gift certificate. It may be uh, a, a, a percentage of uh, the real estate commission that that platform gets as a referral uh, referral agent or referral brokerage. And in those states that allow that to happen, New Jersey is one that that's not permissible, but most others, I think there's 11 other states or 10 other states that don't permit sharing of commission. But in those states where um, you can, then you might get you might have a platform that gives customers say uh, you know 20% of the of the real estate brokerage referral commission that comes back to them and so if that if that platform is offered uh, to another settlement service provider whether it's a mortgage company or a title company uh, and they say hey we can co-brand this and you can tell your customer to come to this platform and if they use us to find an agent or to maybe find a title agent. Um, will give you this this commission, and the question has been, well, isn't that a thing of value to the to the mortgage company or to maybe a title company because they're able to offer that to their consumers, where other companies don't have that relationship? And um, there is one case, um, it's the Agbaldi case, um, that seems to apply to that, uh, but that really in that case, that loan loan originator um, who was able to get a reduction in the settlement fees uh, was really manipulating those fees and manipulating when and to what customers uh, those uh, reductions would apply. He typically, he'd say, well, it looks like I'm not going to get this business. Um, hey, settlement service company or closing company, you know, give me a hundred dollar reduction and then you can, you can apply that hundred dollars to another deal I have down the road. And the CFPB was, you know, adamant that that was, that was not proper. But in this case, I think my view is, and I'm not giving you a legal opinion on it, but I think my view um, and what I've known that the CFPB has looked at this is where the consumer is really benefiting from it. Uh, even if not all, uh, uh, say, mortgage companies have a, have a relationship with that platform, um, and, and even if they can vary the, the reward, um, that seems to be okay because the customer really is benefiting from that, that reward um, and it's not really uh, affecting competition in any material way. Next slide. Um, this, I, I'm not going to read through all of this. You'll have this slide, but this was a uh, consent uh, judgment, consent order between the um, CFPB and Realty South. And you can see here, they didn't use the affiliated business disclosure that was required in Appendix D. Um, they didn't use, and, and when they, with the form they used didn't even have the capital letters that, and the bolding that was, that was required. And basically the Bureau said, we're going to tag you and we're going to make you shut down every single one of your joint ventures. So imagine, you know, one of, some of your joint ventures might be okay. Some of the others might, you know, hopefully they all are, but if they weren't and it was the, the uh, affiliate business disclosure that was a problem, there is precedent for the Bureau to shut all of your joint ventures down um, and, and a hefty, hefty civil penalty. Um, and you can see, I'll just, you know, look later, but you can see the last bullet point 
um, this is the language that was in their affiliated business disclosures. And in some, it was right on the contract of sale. Um, and so this was not, hey, go out and shop around. This was, we're the best, use us. Um, and effectively, they, they were almost forcing their, their customers to, to, to use their affiliated business. So that's, a, that's just an extreme example that you should, you should think about uh, and, and stay as far away as possible. Next slide. So this is a this is a, again just a little bit more realty south. Um, you, you, when you have this joint venture, you can't affirmatively influence them to use it. You 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 can't do a warm handoff as we talked about. Um, the marketing's the marketing that you use can't sort of undercut. Um, or, or camouflage the disclosures that you're supposed to make. Um, you can't just hand out the disclosure that doesn't compl necessarily comply, but at the same rate, do a warm handoff to the, to the joint venture. Um, an example of that would be you give them the affiliated business disclosure, and then you walk them down the hall to the title agent, and the title agent, uh, and you say, hey, this is this is Mr. Smith, and he, and he has this house, he has that house, and oh, Bob, Mr. Smith, this is the greatest guy in sliced bread, and you really should use this title agency because um, they're wonderful and all of my clients use them. That sort of overshadows that disclosure and the purpose of that disclosure. Um, so, you know, it really should be, here's the disclosure, you read it, if you sign it and you give, give me permission to, to place your order or you're going to place your order or your lawyer is going to place the order, um, you, it works that way. But that warm handoff really undercuts all the things that the, that the affiliated business disclosure is supposed to provide to the consumer. Next slide. So I wanted to point out that there are a lot of cases out there, a lot of courts who have said that if there is a violation of Section 8, 8C2, so you have a marketing services agreement that isn't really that tight, there's there's referral arrangements going on that don't, and, and there's no affiliate, I mean, sorry, there's no uh, MSA or any type of um, uh, services rendered for fair market value, um, and there's no way for the consumer to know that there was this relationship going on, uh, the courts have repeatedly found that the, that the one-year statute of limitations for a RESPA violation will be told uh, up until the time the, the, the complaint's been filed. Uh, I mean, certainly if you have a lawyer who's representing a, a one plaintiff or a class of plaintiffs, and you can, you can show that that lawyer is known for two years or three years that this, this plaintiff could be a, a plaintiff in an action, that's that's a way to get around that. But if they're doing discovery on one case and they learn about another set of circumstances that gives rise to a uh, claim under RESPA uh, for a particular class of plaintiffs or or, or individuals, uh, and they and they bring that case within one year of filing it, um, then that's okay. But it, and but it may be the transaction was five, six, seven, ten years ago. Uh, courts have rep repeatedly found that that's that that they're going to toll that time because there's no way for the consumer to find out about it. So just because one year has passed on transactions that may have happened um, around pursuant to or, or in connection with a violation of RESPA doesn't get you off. Um, and so you really need to think about that uh, going forward. Next slide. Um, this is, um, again, just another example of how uh, the transaction occurs three years before they filed the lawsuit. Um, and, and a lot of times plaintiff's counsel will actually make an allegation, uh, not so much, hey, uh, we, there was no way for us to find it out um, because we just didn't know the facts, but they make an allegation of affirmative concealment by the parties. They wanted us not to know. And that goes along, and because, you know, if they plead enough enough facts, even if they turn out not to be right, um, but they plead enough facts of affirmative concealment, the court is likely um, to err on the side of letting the case go forward, uh, and you're not going to win on your motion to dismiss, and you're going to have to go through all this discovery 
to get to the end of the day, either a motion for summary judgment or a trial. Next slide. I'll skip this one. Um, again, this is, a, this is another example out of Maryland. Um, and these are other examples. Um, I commend you to, to read them, but it all comes down to the same thing is that you have all these different type of unearned fees, marketing services agreement, office, arra office arrangements that really didn't exist. And all it was, was uh, the payment of, of, uh, of a thing of value. Like you can, you can't have a mortgage company or a title company pay for all of the marketing that the real estate company is doing. Um, it has to be, again, fair market value. Um, that is the real estate company either has to pay for it or if there's a split, then you know those marketing arrangements, whether any type of marketing or advertisement has to, the split in payment has to be the same as the split in the amount of marketing that's being done for both, for both parties. And that's what these cases really are, uh, they go to. Next slide. I did want to talk about uh, Meridian title uh, in the investigation and settlement. I was involved in that with several other lawyers. Um, and it was very interesting because as we talked about in terms of disclosing um, ownership interest or indirect ownership interest, this was the first time that the Bureau looked at a title agent agency and said, well, you're not telling your consumers who the underwriter is going to be. And as most title agents, no, I, you know, I've got either one underwriter or I've got three underwriters and I just sort of pick, you know, however I pick. It could be an algorithm, it could be whatever. However, it doesn't really matter. Well, in this instance, some of the owners of the title agency, not all of them, about half of them, there were like six of them and three of them also had ownership interest in an underwriter that they used. And the Bureau said, look, you got to provide a, a disclosure. Uh, that there is common ownership. And so when, when the title agency says, go use this underwriter, that the, the consumer understands that some of those owners have a financial interest in making that referral. Uh, and so we, there were a lot of other things that we avoided in this case, but ultimately this was the decision of the CFPB. And it is not, obviously it's not, it's not commonplace that an agency owns um, uh, an underwriter. Um, and, and when you have a direct operations, then that's, that's not an issue. I mean, if you're Fidelity or, or Stewart or, um, uh, or First America, by way of example, if there's direct operations and, and it's a referral on to the, um, to the, to the underwriter, the same, you know, of the parent company, um, you don't need to do a disclosure because that's the only underwriter that they're, that they're using and offering to the consumer to use. But, it, but, if there had been, if the direct operations for some reason <laughs> wanted to, you know, send business to to, um, uh, to to another underwriter and it could choose its own underwriter, um, this this might apply. But I, really, in a rare instance, but it just shows you the length to which the, the bureau will go to make sure that the consumer is getting uh, all the disclosures uh, regarding ownership that uh, that the bureau finds to be appropriate. Next slide. So this is an interesting case. It's out of it's out of Washington, and again, it's something that I, I commend you to read. Um, here you had um, a title um, underwriter, um, an agent who was providing what they said was a platform for marketing, um, but there was so much warm handoff between um, the title agency and this platform. Uh, that the state, uh, and that's the most important thing, is that we actually have a state, not the Bureau, uh, looking into this. Uh, and you can see the allegations. They, they engaged in an agreement, arrangement scheme, and understanding that modus title uh, designed to avoid state insurance regulations, and, and that's the referral fees, uh, offering complementary non-title goods and services to producers of title insurance business in connection with modus title. Again, they were offering things of value to people who were referring. It, again, it was fashioned as some sort of uh, marketing platform for those who were members, um, but the state the state wasn't gonna have anything of it and, and really saw this as nothing more than warm handoffs. And then, and because of those warm handoffs, this was a thing, this platform was a thing of value 
um, to, uh, to those who were referring. But again, takeaway here is you have states that are actually involved as well. Next slide. Just some more about um, MODIS. Um, and, you know, it's just, again, the state takes a great, in Washington is an example, Oregon is an example, uh, Montana, Utah, these, these Northwest states, they really take their anti-kickback uh, provisions, uh, which which may be different and likely are different than regular insurance, uh, home insurance, health insurance, um, and, and other type of uh, life insurance. Most states allow a referral fee, but when you get to title, they don't allow it, uh, and so you have to be really careful about that in those states um, and be be aware of of these states if you're involved in any type of arrangements, C, 8C2 arrangements. Uh, and maybe even 8C4, you really have to figure out what the state's take on it is. Next slide. So these are just uh, at the end of this presentation, we're getting close to the end. Uh, I just wanted to list some of these. Um, so the notion, I hear it all the time, hey, you know, I, I have an attorney whose wife uh, is a licensed title producer. Uh, can't, can I just pay her uh, the commission? Um, for every deal that this, that the lawyer sends to me or his or her you know lawyer spouse, uh, no. Um, first of all, you know it is unlikely that the, that the licensed title producer is doing anything. He's not they're not calling on their on their husband um, or or wife and saying please use my title agency. Um, and so when there's and this is a case uh, out of New Jersey where that was the case, and the bureau uh, and the state. Department of Insurance came down on them, and um, the lawyer didn't lose his his license, but the the title producer did, uh, and the and the title agency did as well. Um, I don't particularly like MSAs with real estate teams um, because the teams are so closely connected to their to the consumer. Now, if the team is is advertising to the general public, uh, it's big enough. You know, it's a huge team. Uh, and they have a website, and they do team advertising. Then, then I think I'm, I'm more comfortable with that. But if it's a small team, two or three lawyers, with maybe one administrative staff person, and really when they're doing the marketing is to their already existing customers, that's that's a no-no. Um, again, we talked a little bit about affiliated businesses that violate controlled business limitations. Uh, there are 11 states. Uh, if you get into an affiliated business in, in a state that limits the, the amount of business that a owner of a title agency can send uh, to the title agency, then it's not that you can't do it. You just need to have, uh, my recommendation is you need to have a uh, sales rep or two that are going out and attempting to get business from uh, someone other than your referral investors, uh, whether it's lawyers, LOs, uh, wealth management companies, whatever, and, and do with that. And there's a different degree of, of oversight. In California, you have five years, oh no, three years to get to the 50-50, but they're very lax. You know, as long as you're showing an effort, they'll be okay. You probably get past the three years. Ohio, Tennessee, not so much. Um, I, I don't, a lot of times people say, um, you know, you can buy more shares if you perform better and bring in more more business uh, as an as an investor, and you show that to the agents. I think that's you know that's almost like you know email is for evidence. It's like I'm only giving this out to those people who are going to send me business. Now, while there's no case law that says you can't do that, um, if you fluctuate based upon performance me metrics, then that's a real problem. Uh, we talked about the customer reward, uh, and, I, and as I said, I think it's permissible. What I would leave you with is that when you have a joint venture or you have an AC2 marketing services agreement or so forth, the company that's getting the referrals cannot subsidize the cost that the other party would have. They have to pay their fair share, and that's true in a joint venture as well. If you're in a joint venture title agency in a real estate company, um, that title company can't say, well, I'll put in all the capital 
or I'll loan you the money to invest, or I'll loan the agents the money to invest, or I'll pay for all the E&O expenses. It can't, everyone has to share in the expense based upon their ownership interest. Uh, and so that's that's a big I, that's a good takeaway for you on on both 8C2 matters and 8C4 joint ventures. And I think that's the last slide. If I'm not, oh, uh, some just some interesting happenings. Um, you know, I'll leave it for you to look. There was a challenge in South Carolina to joint ventures um, because they made an argument that the joint ventures uh, because you need a, a lawyer. Uh, down in uh, South Carolina to run title that, that that the investors were sharing in legal fees that didn't really go anywhere. There is a ton of fair housing issues right now. Be aware of it. If you're in a joint venture and that joint venture is only servicing high end customers uh, and not trying to do anything outside of that, whether it's a whether it's a uh, loan a lender or a title company or even a real estate company. Um, be aware that the Bureau is looking at disparate impact on, uh, and they're looking at that and saying, where are you operating and are you excluding others? You know, you can look at the most recent um, Triton mortgage as, a, as an example of that. Uh, but I'll leave that with you, so because I know we have, we, if we have questions, I want to be able to answer them. All right. Yeah. Thank you, Tripp. I am going to... That's a feedback that said they were hearing an echo. So when I'm talking on uh, trip, I'm just going to mute your mic and then I'll unmute you after I ask you the question. Uh, we do have a few minutes left. So uh, any questions, please uh, get them in the questions box. Um, Elise was wondering if you could uh, expand on permissible versus impermissible work share. All work share in a title agency joint venture or as just a work share um, is permissible as as long as the work is actually being done it's not repetitive of what you're doing um, and the payment is at fair market value the only caveat to that is you can't have a work share in a title joint venture that includes core title services Okay. All right. Um, um, let me see. I'm gonna mute. There we go. Um, examples of disclosure forms. So Kathleen was asking if there's a um, sample disclosure using the capital letters. Yes. All you need to do is go to um, the appendix that I noted to regulation x i mean it literally is online so if you just say affiliated business disclosure see um reg x it'll it'll pop up in that language if you can't find it just email me and i can send it to you cool. and then kind of a follow-up um you know when should the affiliated business disclosure be presented to the, to the buyer can it be shown and signed at closing so no, you cannot or you should not have the buyer sign at closing. You're, the, the rule specifically says at, as close to the referral. So if you know your buyer comes in and you give them your your packet of of information, and, and that's the that's the real estate. I'm sorry. When when the if it's a real estate company that's doing the referral. And that customer comes in and and sally smith is going to be the agent and sally smith gives her all the spiel about why she's a great agent and so forth and and the customer says yeah i'll use you sally great let's go and sally says oh wait by the way i have a, a, a title company that i want to you know i think you should work with um and it's xyz title company should give the disclosure right at that point Usually there's a packet of information that a real estate brokerage provides to buyers uh, when they start the relationship and that disclosure should be should be in there. Um, in fact, what I say to title companies that are, you know, that are running joint ventures is that that order uh, is not uh, processed until the affiliated business disclosure is in the file. 
All right, uh, we're about the top of the hour. Well, we are now two o'clock, but we'll see if we get get through a few more. Um, trip a question about like in Ohio, you said forty percent cap on your firm business. If say they the title agency enters into a relationship with the LLC and one of the real estate agents is part of that LLC. What if that agent is part of another LLC? Do you have to kind of do the math and figure out, you know, overall how much business that agent is sending you or is it 40% of that LLC? Oh, you can't hear me? Uh-oh, it looks like we may have lost trip. Because <laughs> no audience coming through. Still can't hear me? Okay, all right, say a no. So uh, we're gonna have to, uh, you know, conclude. Trip, can't hear you, no. Uh, I don't know if anyone else, let me see if anyone else can hear me. Oh, they can hear me, but uh, cannot trip, we cannot hear trip. So we will, we'll go ahead and sign off, I apologize. Um, if you have questions that we didn't get to, please send them to me, I will connect, connect you with trip. Again, as a reminder, you know, if you missed any of today's webinar, I think others in, in your office would benefit from listening. Uh, a recording of the presentation uh, are, are always available on Alta's website at alta.org forward slash webinars. You'll also get an email with a link to the recording and a copy of the presentation tomorrow. Um, with that, that will bring us to the conclusion of today's presentation. Apologize for um, any uh, for, for all the audio issues we had a little had today. You know, so, Sometimes we still have those uh, those gremlins that, that get us. Um, Trip, I know you can't hear us, but uh, thank you for sharing your expertise on on RESPA and hopefully the the attendees you know glean some information on, on items they should be thinking about when setting setting up any type of relationship. And with that, um, take care, everyone, and we'll see you on the next webinar.